And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. And I call Alex Maskey. Uh, over here, and, uh, last can I call a question num number one, please. Deputy Speaker, policing oversight bodies play an important role in maintaining public confidence in policing and in challenging and supporting the PSNI to improve the quality of policing. However, they are not immune from the current financial position, which necessitates that all areas of the justice system will have to make cuts. All arm's length bodies have been asked to assess the impact of cuts of 10% and 15% against opening 2014-15 baselines. I will continue to practice the front line as far as possible. I have provided additional in-year funding to the Policing Board and Police Ombudsman's Office through the October monitoring round to address pressures within those bodies. I call Alex Maskey. I thank the Minister for that response. Can I ask the Minister, does he not in fact accept the, uh, the fact, regrettably, that uh, the withdrawal of such funding from these uh, bodies will in fact uh, harm their ability to investigate historical incidents in particular and thereby continue to deny access to justice for those many families who are seeking access to justice and truth? Well, Deputy Speaker, I accept the point Mr Maskey makes, although I would remind him that given that the Ombudsman's Office was the only spending area within justice that received uh, an increase in its funding in cash terms over the last four-year period and is subject to the lowest cut this year of only 4.4 per cent, that we are doing all we can to protect that. Uh, if he wishes to make the wider point about dealing with the past, I entirely concur with him. The reality is we desperately need different ways of dealing with the problems of the past, which hopefully will emerge from the current inter-party talks because it's absolutely clear that funded for the present, the justice system cannot meet the needs of the past in terms of the concerns that we have for victims to ensure that they get where possible justice and, if not, truth. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister explain to the House why uh, he has decided to only give a third of the £29 million additional funding that he received to the PSNI front line, whilst he continues to protect the Police Ombudsman's Office. And he has stated he gave them more money, he has limited the impact of the Ombudsman's budget by only a 4% cut, and yet he deprives the PSNI the money that they need to protect people today. Well, Deputy Speaker, the outgoing chair of the Justice Committee certainly makes a good rant of it, but the reality is we are not depriving the police. We are not protecting other people at their expense. The largest area of expenditure within the justice budget is that which goes towards policing. And there it is inevitable on the scale of the cuts which has been imposed on me by an arrangement which changed details in year by the will of the majority of executive members, effectively the DUP Sinn Féin members of the executive imposed an in-year cut without any consultation and changed the rules entirely for this year. In the face of that, in the face of that it was impossible to do anything other than accept that there would be an inevitable cut onto policing. I have been doing what I can to protect the front line. I will continue to do what I can to protect the front line, but it is not possible to protect it fully on the basis of the cuts that were imposed. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And Minister, noting uh, that uh, the, the, the importance of dealing with the past actually is about a dozen poisoning uh, are, are today, and uh, it is part of the ongoing talks. But will the Minister also share uh, my concern about the increasing number of people with mental ill health and the increased inequalities in our society are weighing heavily on your, uh, on your department's uh, uh, expenditure and had there been better and more sensible uh, dialogue uh, and looking at how we deal with mental ill health and inequality across the executive, then your budget might not be in the situation it is. Well, I appreciate Mrs Kelly's point. I'm not sure that I can claim a unique distinction in terms of mental health, but there is no doubt as we look at those issues of coming from the legacy of the past, the individuals who have suffered and who may well have their mental health concerns exacerbated by the failure to fund adequately the investigations into the past, there is no doubt that will continue to create problems. It is another further reason why we so desperately need to do something about the past and address it in a comprehensive and joined up way that meets the needs of victims. Can I advise members that question 8 has been withdrawn and also now call Nelson McCausland. Question number 2. With permission, Deputy Speaker, I'll take questions 2 and 15 together. The annual cost of legal aid continues to exceed the budget which was allocated on devolution. 
The budget for the current financial year is £75 million, with expenditure on legal aid estimated at £109 million. This has created a significant pressure on the budget of my department, and I've had to make cuts in other areas in order to meet that demand. I've introduced a number of reforms to reduce the level of fees, without which the cost would have been higher. I will shortly implement further reform to Crown Court fees, and my officials are engaging with the legal profession on reform of fees for civil legal aid. I plan to introduce new civil fees from the 1st of April next year. As I have previously told this House, legal aid is demand-led. In 2010-11, for example, there were 1,742 cases disposed of in the Crown Court. This rose year by year until it reached an excess of 2,600 cases in 2013-14. While this increase in disposals has had a positive impact on reducing the backlog in the Crown Court, it inevitably increased the cost to the Legal Aid Fund. It will not be possible to bring the cost of legal aid within budget solely by cutting fees, and it's been necessary to start to identify further options for reform. I have put forward proposals for reform of financial eligibility tests for civil legal aid, and I'm currently consulting on a range of measures which would reduce the current scope of legal aid. I intend to ensure that the provision is sufficient to meet human rights obligations and to protect the most vulnerable in society. The current level of spend cannot be maintained and fundamental change will be required. That is why I have commissioned the Access to Justice Review Part 2 to inform future developments. I expect the review to report by the end of the financial year. I call Mr. Um, the Minister received uh, in his budget an additional £29 million on the back of the pressures on policing budget. Uh, why then was only £13 million of the £29 million delivered to policing? How much of the remaining £16 million was devoted to legal aid? And I welcome the fact he has launched a further consultation on legal aid, but would he agree that his actions so far have been far too little, too late, and that it is unacceptable that such a large amount of the additional funding is going, going to legal aid. He says it's an issue that the, dates the back to The member has devolution. asked a number of questions there. Minister. I think the member has repeated the same point a number of times, Mr Deputy Speaker. The reality is the allocation which was given in October monitoring was to cover the pressing needs across the department, and it made reference to both policing costs and legal aid costs. As the House will be well aware, legal aid is a matter which is a contractual obligation to pay at this stage, and I had no option but to take a significant section of the £29 billion to pay that. Had it been the case that the Justice Committee had moved more speedily on some of the reforms I sought to introduce, we would be in a slightly less difficult position. I call Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, interesting answers from, from the Minister there. Uh, but we, I totally accept uh, the need for review and reform of the legal aid system and uh, the reduction in, in the finances that goes with it. But would the Minister accept that there are other pressures within the Department of Justice, like avoidable delays? And would the Minister tell us where he is going with those issues to reduce the, the justice budget in those aspects? Well, Mr. Elliott raises an interesting point about avoidable delay. I did make the point earlier uh, that by uh, speeding up cases uh, through the Crown Courts, we'd actually reduced the problem of delay. But avoidable delay is a problem which is not directly related to the issue of costs. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I, I think that uh, there is a political consensus that there needs to be a reduction in legal aid costs. However, would the Minister outline the specific savings that arise out of the change in the legal aid rules uh, 2011 and what uh, assistance that has been in terms of reducing the pressures. In answer to Mr McGuinness's point, Deputy Speaker, the 2011 change to the Crown Court rules, to which I think he refers, resulted in a reduction in approximately £20 million of legal aid expenditure. As I highlighted, because of the increase in the number of cases, uh, that has to some extent been lost because of further cases going through. But on an average year, that is what the benefit would be. Uh, it is, of course, only a small part of the reductions that need to be made, which is why we're concentrating at this point on civil legal aid costs. Moving on, I call Bromham McGahan. Question three. Deputy Speaker, I am satisfied that the appropriate and robust governance structures were and can continue to be in place for the Community Safety College project. It is a complex and important project that we have to get right, hence the importance of the current review. My department, DHSSPS, 
and the three services are together responsible for delivering an integrated facility that meets the training requirements of the three services at an affordable cost and which is sustainable in terms of running costs. The College programme team reports to the programme board, which in turn reports to the steering group, which includes the departmental accounting officers of justice and health, the accounting officers of the three services, members of the policing board, the chief executive of the strategic investment board. The steering group then reports through the two ministers to the executive. I call Bronwyn McGahan. Gormi Ogaday, I thank the Minister for his response. Is, is the Minister committed to the development of the Community Safety College on the Desert Creek site? Gormi Ogaday. Well, Deputy Speaker, as I have made clear, I am committed to the programme for government commitment, which is to the building of an integrated college to provide facilities for the three services working together. In current circumstances, it is not possible to say that that is a commitment to the Desert Creek site. Though clearly the amount of preparatory work which has been done for Desert Creek means it is still the only site currently in consideration, but the review which is currently being conducted may, and I stress the word may, lead to that having to be examined. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. If we were to believe the Sunday papers, the College at Desert Crate has already um, been written off by those behind the scenes. But I would like to ask the Minister if the Department's failure to deliver the full package becomes more likely. Will the Minister agree to immediate consultations with other uh, government departments to ensure that other suitable uses are considered for Desert Crate site and the money invested so far is not wasted and the expectations for economic uh, economic opportunity for the Cookstown area are not lost. Well, I'm not sure whether it's an appropriate thing to say to some journalists, but I can say to the member, Deputy Speaker, that when I read things in the Sunday world saying sources close to the minister, I tend to assume they've made them up, and that is certainly my position in this case. Uh, there has been no source close to the Minister of Justice, nor, as far as I'm aware, any source close to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, who has said that another site is now the favoured site. Uh, but what does need to happen at the moment is the review which is underway to look at what the options are and to see what needs to be done to scope out the potential training needs for the three services in the future, given that we are expecting to see reduced numbers. Uh, but as the member will know, that is a, a matter which I promise the local MLAs will be carried out as expeditiously as possible in order that we can re-examine the position. But we have to ensure value for money and we have to ensure a worthwhile project going forward. There are difficulties in necessarily bringing in other departments and other services into a training facility which has to operate on a secure basis because of elements which are there, but it's certainly an issue which can be considered and will be considered if it's possible to expand the use. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of my um, comments to him in respect of the difficulties that the way that this was announced has um, carried forward. And I think it's been less than uh, appropriate in the sense of the difficulties that it has caused, certainly locally within the constituency. Can the Minister assure the House and give that assurance that going forward, the announcement of this review whether it's a review for review or whatever the process is, that due diligence will be um, adhered to in respect of how this is handled and who um, the people who are responsible um, give that information to in the first case so that it isn't leaked incorrectly to the press and cause the difficulties that it has done. Well, Deputy Speaker, I entirely agree with the point that Mr McRae makes. Unfortunately, I'm not sure I'm in a position to ensure that leaks don't happen. We know only too well across a range of public services uh, in this place and elsewhere of how frequently leaks do happen. Um, I certainly will do my best to ensure that the facts are put on the table as I did to him and other MLAs in meetings last week, uh, to the Justice Committee last week, and will do to representatives of the local councils this week. But it is important that those who hear the facts also help in ensuring that it's facts and not speculation that gets reported. I call Dominic Bradley. Would the Minister agree with me that there is a need for a proper investigation into the way in which this project was handled? Because there is 
a general consensus that it was handled very badly. Well, Deputy Speaker, I need to be careful given that there is the potential for legal action, but I think most members will be aware that there are concerns raised about the way in which certain aspects uh, of the work have been carried out uh, in relation to contracts uh, with some of the external advisers and consultants. Uh, I uh, have certainly been assured that those matters are being followed up at this stage, but we need to ensure that that is done in a way which best maximises the value for the taxpayer. Moving on, I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number four. With permission, Deputy Speaker, I'll take questions four and six together. Throughout the Budget 2011-15 period, I've sought to protect frontline public services as far as possible against cuts to my department's budget. In allocating budgets at the beginning of the four-year period, I ensured that frontline areas received the lowest percentage budget cuts, with areas of the core department making significantly higher percentage savings. In relation to additional budget cuts this year, I have again ensured that frontline services have received the lowest percentage cuts. My core department has experienced cuts of between 10% and 16% this year to allow funding to be reallocated to the front line. For example, the budget cut for the Northern Ireland Prison Service has been limited to 3.5% and funding has been provided to complete the Prison Service Staff Exit Scheme. I outlined the impact of in-year cuts to the Justice Committee on the 1st of October this year. Whilst these impacts have since been offset to a limited degree by the allocation of an additional £29 million to the Department of Justice, significant frontline impacts remain, including, for example, a severely detrimental impact on police resilience and capacity, an immediate impact on the operational prison regime, a significant impact on the court system, including the closure of courthouses and a further reduction to essential frontline staff, and cuts to frontline probation services, including the number of probation officers and the ability to monitor offenders when caseload is increasing. In the absence of an agreed position on the past, the pressures facing the justice system in relation to legacy issues continue to increase. Cuts will impact significantly on the work and speed of legacy investigations in the police and the police ombudsman's office. It is too early to provide specific details about the impact of budget cuts in 2015-16, but the issues set out above will continue. I call Stuart Dixon for a supplementary. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for the answer to your question and thank you for your commitment to uh, ensuring the protection of frontline services. Minister, can you confirm to the House that despite uh, the uh, ring fencing of certain uh, DODJ bu budgets, the reality of uh, the effect of those budgets over that period of time and into now is in fact that your department has received and suffers the highest level of cuts of any government department? Yes, Deputy Speaker, that is exactly the case. Ring fencing for the DOJ for the 2011-15 period did not mean protection for the Department of Justice. It actually meant a 7.2% cash baseline reduction across the budget, while the, uh, the block as a whole, as I understand it, had, had a marginal increase in cash terms, though of course both also had a rather larger decrease in real terms. Uh, we then, in the course of the June monitoring round, had that ring fencing arrangement torn up so that the DOJ took the largest single cuts of any department, given the protection for health and education. And that is the circumstance which we have to live with. That is why protecting the front line has now become extremely difficult, whilst we had managed that fairly well for the first three and a half years. I call Alistair McDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, my concern, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, three, I think it was three percent he mentioned there, of a cut in the prison service. What impact is that going to have on prison reform? Because we all know that prison reform is urgently needed, and my concern is that that cut will further delay, block, slow down, whatever you want to describe it as, the reform of our prisons. Well, I'm grateful to Dr. Macdonald for his support for the work being done by the prison service. The reality is. Uh, those cuts are still at a relatively low level compared to other areas of the department, though it is not yet clear what cuts will have to be imposed in next year. Given the amount which has already been done in the prison reform programme, the significant reduction in staffing costs, for example, uh, we have actually managed to make progress that there has been an, imp an improvement in the reform work being done for prisoners at the same time as costs have been taken out so far. But there is a limit as to how far and how fast that process can continue, and there will be costs to the prison service 
if those cuts continue to be taken out faster than the reforms can be made. I call William Humphrey. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I first of all, Mr. Speaker, condemn those who would attack police officers last night in North Belfast? And they have no place in this society, and I hope anyone with any information will pass it on and have these people removed from it. In relation to frontline services, the minister talks about, given the budgetary pressures and the pressures on the police, can I ask the minister, does he not agree with me that the full implementation of the National Crime Agency to Northern Ireland is essential? And can I ask him what, what progress he's made in his negotiations and conversations with the SDLP and Sinn Féin to ensure that happens? Well, first of all, Deputy Speaker, I of course endorse the remarks which Mr Humphrey has made of condemnation of those who attacked the police last night, who put at risk the lives of police officers and indeed of civilians in the area, including those from within Brompton Park and the Idoin area that they would purport to represent. And such attacks must be condemned. And I would certainly join him in urging that anyone who has any information whatsoever which might help deal with the perpetrators comes forward and gives it. Uh, on his substantive question, uh, yes, it is absolutely clear that had we the National Crime Agency in operation, it would make some benefits, not huge benefits, but some benefits uh, by being operationally uh, able to operate in Northern Ireland, uh, then we could see uh, some reduction in the pressures which currently exist on the PSNI. Uh, as far as the negotiations go, I have had further meetings with the two nationalist parties. We have yet to reach agreement on what I regard as the essential way of ensuring that we fight issues like human trafficking, child exploitation, fuel fraud and tobacco smuggling by using the resources which are freely available from the NCA. I call Michaela Boyle. Uh, does the Minister agree that, does it, that the decision to move away from the commitments made by the PSNI in relation to the Bloody Sunday murders only serves to undermine confidence in the justice system? Gormagut. Deputy Speaker, it would be very easy for each and every one of us to identify cuts being made which we believe are reducing confidence in the justice system. If the justice system is going to have its budget trimmed in the way that has been carried out in year by the majority of the executive and which we face next year, then there will continue to be cuts. That is an unfortunate inevitability. Whatever I do to protect the front line, whatever I do to protect services which provide confidence, I cannot keep up the level of services because the budget is not available and the cuts being imposed on me have to be passed on to the agencies of the justice system. That is simple fact. Unless members of this House are willing to accept that we need to do something about fundraising, then they need to acknowledge that cuts are going to be made. I call Mickey Brady. Cast over a query, question five. In maintaining a regime whereby convictions can become spent, a three-way balance must be struck between allowing a person to put their past behind them, recognising the needs of employers and those who work voluntarily with vulnerable people, and ensuring public protection and safety. We must always be particularly alert to the needs to ensure that those who work with children and vulnerable adults are fully assessed. I recently introduced legislation to make it possible for some old or minor convictions to be filtered out from an individual's criminal record. Beyond that, however, any proposal to adjust the period within which a sentence can become spent, similar to the changes recently in England and Wales, would be a major change. Such changes for Northern Ireland would engage a wide body of interests across the executive ministers, the public and the Assembly as a whole. Given the scale of the changes involved, the breadth of interest and in issues involved at this stage of the Assembly mandate, I have no immediate plans to introduce similar provisions. I will, however, keep a watching brief on the operation of the new regime in England and Wales. I call Mickey Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister agree that these provisions will, will extend an important opportunity for re-access to the labour market for those individuals trying to move on from a conviction? Well, I agree with Mr Brady that that will be one effect, but I also pointed out in my principal answer that there is a three-way balance and it is not simply the ability of individuals to move on in the labour market that we have to take account of. I call uh, Edwin Putz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In terms of sentencing, does the Minister agree that uh, for our elderly population, many of who are living in fear, uh, that it is not an unreasonable thing that minimum, sen minimum sentencing is introduced for those who would abuse, rob, and, and hurt our elderly population? Well, Deputy Speaker, minimum sentencing is not something which is a normal part 
of UK practice. On a previous occasion in the House, Mr Alistair has reminded us of the danger of having minimum sentences for those who assault uh, pensioners when he referred to the case of a paedophile pensioner who was assaulted by the father of his victim. I think we need to be very careful of the implications of such matters. Moving on, I call Colin Eastwood. Question number seven. Here we go. I have no immediate plans to carry out a review of the procedures for completing scheduled hospital appointments. The Northern Ireland Prison Service takes appropriate and robust actions to ensure that prisoners who must attend outside scheduled appointments for medical treatment are brought there safely and returned to prison as quickly as possible. The Prison Service keeps its security procedures under review, including the procedures for escorting prisoners outside the closed prison environment. The arrangements are also subject to inspection by Sijini if required. The most recent inspection was very positive. I call Colin Eastwood for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that it's particularly degrading for uh, prisoners returning from hospital to be uh, subjected to a full body search, especially when there's no uh, intelligence whatsoever to suggest that they would require a full body search? Well, Mr. Eastwood raises two particular points there. Um, certainly, body searches are to an extent degrading for those who carry them out, as indeed for those who are subject to them. And that's why the prison service is moving in areas like that towards an intelligence-led approach. Uh, but there's also a significant need to ensure the safety and security of prisons and prisoners and prison staff. And uh, we have not yet found an alternative way of ensuring proper searching other than full body searches. I call Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. In relation to the point made by Mr Eastwood, given that in August 2010 there was an, a, an arrangement to bring in uh, new technology, that was supported by the Honours report, and indeed only last week the sort of independent assessors have made the same conclusion. And can the member is, it, the is it not unreasonable that four years into this process that there is a failure that we haven't got a technological replacement for full body search? Well, Mr McCartney is aware of the efforts that were made around millimetre wave scanners, which simply proved to be not effective as required for prisons. And at this stage, we are awaiting responses from others as we look at the issue of transmission X-rays. I'm certainly keen that we should get that decision as fast as possible. We're currently in hand of the UK authorities. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister confirm if the administrative arrangements with each of the range of health trusts uh, under which hospitals uh, operate that occasionally get uh, uh, prisoners received, uh, that they are identical in every respect? No, Deputy Speaker, I can't confirm the arrangements which may be made between the South Eastern Trust, which has responsibility for care in prisons, and the external trusts uh, in terms of hospital appointments. If there are specific issues you wish to write to me about, I'll happily mm -hmm. respond to you. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question nine. Yes. Deputy Speaker, the Prison Service is committed to developing and embedding opportunities for prisoners through career advice and life guidance. This has been recognised as a key contributing factor to effective resettlement and rehabilitation. NIPS, working in partnership with a range of service providers and key partners, has introduced a personal development model and provides a range of advice for prisoners on lifestyle topics such as healthy living, managing money and working towards goals, as well as more careers oriented advice on skills for employment and making informed career and progression choices. Through Niacro Job Trap, NIPS offers an employment focused programme providing individual needs-based advice and support regarding training and skills development to increase employment opportunities. I call David Hildage for supplementary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that response. But what help and assistance or potential guidance is available uh, to the victim of a prisoner uh, that is about to be released? The responsibility of providing advice and assistance uh, to victims is not a responsibility which lies with the Department of Justice. The members will be aware of the work which has been done under the victim and witness uh, charter arrangements to ensure that we provide support through the criminal justice process to such victims. And that is the end of our list of, list of questions. We now move on to topical questions. Nelson McCausland is not in his place. I call Daki Mackay. Uh, Gurren, I got to leave Concord. 
just give me two seconds. Um, can, I, can I ask the Minister uh, in regard to the Railway Street uh, Addiction Service uh, in Ballymena? This service has saved the Department of Justice millions of pounds uh, over the past uh, 14 years. It has prevented drug-related crime. It has reduced prison admissions. Can the member come to his question, please? Can I ask the Minister, does he not see uh, that the proposed cut to this service uh, will only lead to the revisiting of the devastating effects uh, of drugs uh, on my community in North Antrim and in the Northern Trust area uh, in general? Well, Deputy Speaker, the reality is that this is another of those difficult decisions which have had to be taken given the scale of cuts which is being imposed on the Department of Justice. It is fine to say whether or not particular projects save money, but the simple reality is that the Department does not have the money to continue doing uh, the sort of work it has been doing in conjunction with a number of community partners on issues like this project. But it is not the case that all such work is being reduced. As I understand it, the Northern Trust continues to be funded by the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety on issues like drug addiction. That funding will continue. But in the current circumstances, it is simply not possible for the DOJ to continue to make its contribution towards that project. I call Dr. Mackay for supplementary. Like it. Th this project doesn't only save money, it, it saves lives. Uh, and the, the cut to which uh, the Minister refers to, the cut that the Department of Justice is putting on this is a 100 per cent cut. It's not a 14 per cent or a 10 per cent cut or whatever. Uh, so the Minister needs to rethink uh, the amount of money he's given to this particular project. To question, and will the Minister uh, at least do the courtesy of meeting myself, the families affected uh, by drugs and staff from the centre to discuss how we can resolve this issue? Well, Deputy Speaker, if Sinn Féin members are prepared to rethink their refusal to take money from those who have assets in this country and fund the kind of services which are needed by the people who benefit from the Railway Street Referral Project, I'm quite happy to reconsider how funds are allocated. But unless members of this Assembly recognise that we cannot cut a reducing cake to produce bigger slices all the time, it will simply not be possible to continue with the work that we seek to do. I call Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he's satisfied that staffing levels in our prisons are sufficient to ensure the safety of our officers? Well, staffing levels are reviewed regularly within prisons, within different areas of the prison. Uh, risk assessments are carried out as to what is appropriate and what is necessary, and it is certainly the case that that is an ongoing work. I have no reason to believe at this stage that we do not have adequate staffing levels in every part of our prison system. I call Danny Ken for supplementary. Thank you very much. But given the uh, seriousness of recent attacks on the prison officers and the fact that attacks on prison officers have doubled in the last three years, is it not the case that we need to do something now and to change it so that they, have, they are more secure and he lives up to his duty of care to those officers? Well, Deputy Speaker, although Mr. Kenahan raises what appears a logical point, the reality is the more, more attacks have happened on prison officers during those uh, periods of the daytime when there are more officers on duty than have happened at times when there are fewer staff on duty on landings. So that would rather suggest that the reverse is the case than what he thinks. So there is, a, there is no suggestion that it's the numbers of officers on duty on any particular landing at a particular time which have reduced the numbers of assaults. I call Old McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, given the um, deadly attack uh, this morning on police officers uh, in North Belfast in the Ardoin Tridel Avenue area, uh, could the uh, and it was a deadly attack because three officers could have been killed. There's no doubt about that. W would the minister give his assessment uh, of the security situation in relation to uh, distant Republicans? who obviously carried out that attack. Well, again, I repeat the point which I made to Mr Humphrey earlier on, that it was clearly an attack which attempted to kill police officers, but might also have killed civilians, including civilians on the Ardoin side of the Crumlin Road, which those who presumably carried out the attack would purport to represent. And therefore, it must be condemned by all of us, and we must all appeal for information to be given where it can be given to assist to put the perpetrators behind bars. Uh, in terms of my assessment of the situation, 
I clearly you know, do not personally make assessments, but what is reported to me is that the situation remains with a severe threat directed against police officers in Northern Ireland. It is clear that there are some particular difficulties in Northern Ireland which are exacerbated in, in some geographical areas more than others. And frankly, Ardoin Twadell is one of those which has most problems. And there is no doubt that the continuing presence of protesters in Twadell Avenue is leading to police officers having to sit on the Crumlin Road and is therefore putting them at risk of attack, not just from the sort of stone throwing exercise which has happened at times from the Unionist side, but also now in a very deadly way from the Nationalist side of the line. It is important that we all use all influences we can to deal with that, to encourage people to report crimes to the police, to cooperate with the police, and to ensure that the good work being done by the PSNI is backed by local representatives and local people in that part of North Belfast in particular. I, call Alden McGuinness. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for his very comprehensive reply in relation to the attack this morning, and I share his condemnation of that attack and appeal to people to give information to the PSNI in relation to the attack if they have that information. But I also share his view in relation to the Trudell camp. And would the Minister uh, join me in saying that the people who are protesting there have made their point, and it's now time for them to end that uh, uh, particular demonstration, permanent demonstration, and to enter into dialogue with the local community? Well, Deputy Speaker, though, um, though I might agree with Mr McGuinness that it's certainly time that those who sit in the camp at the top of Trudell accepted they had made their point and that nothing further could be achieved, I'm not sure that they are likely to either listen to Mr McGuinness or to me in that view being put forward. I would, however, hope that members of this House, particularly those who represent North Belfast and who have links to those who are currently in the camp, would use their influence so that we stop wasting a significant sum of money every night of the year and we put police officers' lives at risk because they're forced to be on static guard in such a difficult area. And the people encourage anyone with whom they have influence to reduce the tension, to withdraw from the current protest activities and to ensure that matters can be dealt with in a more constructive way than that which currently costs a million pounds at life, a million pounds a month, and could have cost three lives last night. Moving on, I call Pat Sheaton. Sheaton. Carmel, I've got to ask Kian Corla. In the light of the recent assessment by the Council of Europe Commissioner uh, that failure to properly investigate uh, state killings could leave the British government in breach of the European Convention on Human Rights. Could the Minister tell us what discussions he has had with Downing Street uh, seeking a commitment from them uh, to properly investigate those killings? Well, I can inform Mr Sheehan that although I spoke to the Commissioner during his visit, and I have not spoken recently to the Prime Minister on such matters, but on every occasion recently that I have met uh, the Secretary of State, I have made it clear to her that I do not believe the budget for the justice system today is capable of dealing with all those issues from the past. And I have made it absolutely clear, as the Commissioner said, that I believe the British Government has a significant responsibility for funding whatever new institutions we might establish for dealing with the past. As indeed I have made clear that I believe the Irish Government also has a responsibility, though probably somewhat less quantitatively. Uh, that has so far not achieved any result, but I certainly hope that the inter-party talks will lead to something which will see new institutions being established, agreements being reached in a way which meets the needs of victims of the past, which deals with all those outstanding legacy issues, and which is properly funded by the government which was responsible at the time those issues happened. I call Pat Sheen for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And would he agree with me that he has a duty to the people here in the North not to allow the British government to simply wash its hands of this issue and to put a proper financial package in place to investigate these killings? Well, I'm not sure that I can ensure that the British government does anything. I would certainly use my influence to ensure 
that the British government plays its part in funding some proper institutions which would look at the whole remit of all those issues from the legacy of the past which need to be dealt with to meet the needs of victims in every section of the society. Um, however, I fear that Mr Sheehan gives me somewhat more ability to take decisions on behalf of the UK Cabinet than I currently have. Moving on, I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what proposals does he or the Department have to deal effectively with the widespread and wide-scale use of legal highs that's, just, that's still causing a lot of trouble in our communities. Well, Mr Byrne correctly highlights the concerns which have been raised about legal highs, and I know there's been a significant amount of action has happened recently on that particular front. Um, certainly, uh, the very positive work which was done against legal highs uh, by environmental health staff uh, from Belfast City Council uh, was a very significant step forward in using the legislative issues which do arise around the matter um, of consumer product safety legislation. I believe similar uh, suggestions have been shared with others, including possibly Oma District Council as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, the key issue now will be to look at the, uh, the report which has come from the Home Office, which of course has responsibility for what is a non-devolved issue, um, see what lessons can be learned. I noticed that there were some specific references to the approach which has been taken by the Irish authorities, which may well be the best way forward for the UK uh, to follow through. And we will be working from the DOJ with the Home Office as it looks, looks at its responsibilities. And then if there are, you know, if there's work needs to be done in conjunction with other departments in Northern Ireland, I will certainly give an assurance that my department will be part of that. I call Joe Byrne for supplementary. Yeah, I thank the Minister for his answer, but would the Minister accept that urgency is now needed to address this in a comprehensive way and legislation needs to be initiated and hopefully can he advise us if he has had any formal discussions with his counterpart in the Republic in relation to this matter? Well, I could certainly agree with Mr Byrne, Deputy Speaker, about the need for urgency. The problem is urgency which requires legislation uh, and Westminster legislation looking at the use of the, you know, whether it's amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act of 1971 may not be as urgent as he would wish in the context of a pending Westminster general election. But I certainly think we have highlighted the benefits of the law as already exists and we need to ensure that people uh, like EHOs in the various local councils are made aware of that to use it where it is possible. Um, as far as discussions with my counterpart in the Republic, um, the report is only out at the very end of October, but I will very shortly be meeting uh, Francis Fitzgerald, the Minister for Justice and Equality, and I will certainly be taking the opportunity of that meeting to discuss this amongst a range of other issues which have cross-border concerns. I call Megan Fearon. Last King Gorla, um, Minister, the Chief Constable George Hamilton recently said that uh, spending reductions would fundamentally change how and where policing was delivered. Can I ask for the Minister's view and uh, the understanding of that statement? Well, I think Ms. Fearon would perhaps be best advised to ask the Chief Constable about what the Chief Constable meant by his statement if she, uh, you know, if she doesn't understand it. It seems to me uh, that faced with the budget cuts which are being imposed on the justice system, there will be very significant changes to every aspect of justice. And given that the police service is the largest spending area of the justice system, they will inevitably bear their share of cuts as well. Uh, exactly how the operational uh, issues will carry through is an issue for the Chief Constable and not for me. And he will have to make the decisions as to how to deploy the reduced resources he is likely to see this year and next year. I call Megan Fearon for supplementary. Just to make clear, I actually do understand. I was asking for your department's understanding. Um, but I was just wondering, is, is it you and the Chief Constable saying that it's not that the police would arrive on time or too late to a crime, crime scene, but would they arrive at all? Well, I think people need to recognise the reality of what cuts will be, uh, will possibly mean that some cases which would have merited police attention in the past will not necessarily now merit a response uh, in the immediate circumstances, though perhaps a follow-up will come through by neighbourhood officers rather than response teams, depending upon the precise circumstances of the case. If we look at what is happening in other jurisdictions in these islands, there is still probably a significantly higher rate of response and speedy response from PSNI than would be the case elsewhere. And we need to face the reality of that as we look at budget costs and the competing pressures which apply across the department. Questions to the Justice Minister. 